Hello, everyone, and welcome to our program, Michigan Notable Author Spotlight, Sport Ship Dog of the Great Lakes with author Pamela Cameron. We're so delighted to have you join us this evening. My name is Katherine Jones, and I am one of the librarians here at Portage District Library. A little bit about our special guest before we welcome her on to the program this evening. Author Pamela Cameron received her Master's of Library Science degree from Western Michigan University and served as an elementary and middle school librarian and a public librarian in Wisconsin and Michigan. She is a member of the Association for Great Lakes Maritime History, the Great Lakes Lighthouse Keepers Association, and the Great Lakes Historical Society. She is also the author of Sport, Shit Dog of the Great Lakes, which is what we're going to be talking about tonight. That book won the 2020 Library of Michigan Notable Book Award, the 2019 Historical Society of Michigan State History Award, as well as the 2019 Moonbeam Children's Book Award. Pamela Cameron's research and writing of sport was based on Mary Oliver's quote, every day I walk into the world to be dazzled, then to be reflective. A native of Greenville, she resides in Kalamazoo where her daily walks give her new writing ideas. So Pamela, I'm going to uh, have you join us. Welcome to the program and thank you for being here today. Thank you, Catherine. It's great to be here in Portage, Michigan. <laughs> it's lovely to have you. A little bit of housekeeping for our attendees today. If you want to say hi to the author or ask a question, please put it in the chat. Later in the program, you should also be able to use the raise your hand button to verbally ask a question on the, by using uh, your voice to talk and ask our author a special question. So it's wonderful to have you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? What do you enjoy? Uh, where do you live? Um, what do you like to do? Okay, a general question, fun. Well, I'm a grandma of four children and a mom to two children. So through those years, I've enjoyed reading children's books. That's been part of my career. And it's also a big part of my personal life. I have a husband, John, and we live in the Portage, Michigan area. And we like to be outside a lot. And especially this summer, even when it was hot, we were outside eating our supper on our deck. So I guess that shows we're outside people. This weekend, we will go camping. So I oh how fun that I, and definitely we through the years with our children and even continuing we love to go to, to historical sites cultural sites and enjoy what is out there for everyone to visit. That's wonderful and Portage is a great place to do a lot of those things so I understand why you call it home. Yes. <laughs> So tell us a little bit um, before we get into the book, why did you decide to become a writer? I'm going to make that into a little bit of a joke. I th think that we are all writers. And in the process of writing this book, I thought back to when I began to write in grade school. And I think everybody can reflect on that. And that pushed me on. And I thought of my high school writing teacher. And I have that encouraged me to think I could be a writer when I never thought I was a writer. So it's an example that we sometimes think we can't do something, but we just keep at it and we make it happen. So I, now I guess I feel like I'm more an, of an author than a writer. There's someone once told me there's a difference, you know, writers, we, we really think they're, they're at their desk all day long. Authors get a book published but I, I like the concept that I've improved my writing, I believe. That, that's great. And according to your principles, we have several uh, so, right, current writers, perhaps soon to be authors in the audience. So thanks for being here tonight. Oh, great. Um, speaking about that transition from writing to authorship, uh -huh. um, how did you find the story about sport and why did you decide to write about him? Several years ago, my husband and I were going to be, and we did, uh, we were volunteer 
lighthouse keepers at a lighthouse, Grand Traverse in Michigan. And we knew that we weren't lighthouse experts. We knew a lot of people would come to the, to the lighthouse and they would be experts. So I came to the Portage Library and checked out a lot of, of your lighthouse books because I like the narrative, the look of a, of a book where you can see so, much, so many photos and see the, the story of a narrative nonfiction book. And in one of those books, Great Lakes Lighthouses, there was just a page about sport. And the author of that book had just mentioned it in passing. And that piqued my interest because I thought this story of a dog who was a ship dog from 1914 to 1926, his story cannot be for forgotten. And that's that stayed in my mind just a couple months and then I started researching sport. That's an incredible story that you discovered right here in the library book. Yes, yes. and then I ended up buying that book. <laughs> I still have that book. <laughs> That's yeah. wonderful. Oh, it all started at Portage Public Library. <laughs> well, I, I may be biased, but I have to say it's a pretty good place to be. Yeah. Okay. So this story about sport, many of our audience members are probably familiar, but some of them may be new to the story. Would you be willing to read a little bit from the book so uh, more of us can get familiar? Yes, that would be great. I, I'll share a few pages and also tell you about some of the pages. And then after that, I'll share some slides also of the historical research. That's that would be there. lovely. Yeah, that's, I love this photographs that really kept me moving on my research. I'm going to let you take over more of the screen here. So I'll disappear, but I'm gonna enjoy the story to you. Okay, thanks, Catherine. Sport, ship dog of the Great Lakes. Now, Renee Grafe is the illustrator of sport. And when she decided, and we talked about having a lighthouse and a dog and a ship on the cover, we knew it would work because the book really is about a dog named Sport and his life on a ship, the Hyacinth, and how that ship was connected to lighthouses. With a storm rolling in over Lake Michigan, the docks seemed even busier than usual. Big ships made their way into port and dropped anchor in the Milwaukee River. Sirens and bells sounded warnings. Hurried dock workers shouted to each other in the rain. No one noticed a skinny puppy wandering the docks. No one saw where he ended up. And the rain began. So there's sport as a puppy. Until the hyacinth arrived. Off the starboard, dog in the water, dog in the water. Captain, we're taking the dinghy down. Albert and Clifford didn't wait for their captain's okay. Quickly, the two crewmen lowered the boat into the water. They tried to reach the puppy before the river current carried him out into the lake. Come here, pup, come here. We'll help you, they called. Come on, we'll get you. Just as they reached the dog, Albert reached out and wrapped his hands around the puppy and pulled him to safety. So there's Albert and Clifford and those were the men, the crewmen, those are the names of the crewmen that did rescue sport. Now they're back, they take him back up on the hyacinth. They, they get out of their small little boat and get back, pulled back up onto the larger ship. Actually, I'll go back here and remind, to let you see that better. There's the hyacinth right there and there, there's Albert and Clifford as they went out to rescue sport and he's way down there. He's just a little dot in the water. So they're back on the big ship and lovely illustration by Renee. The captain 
ran his hands over the dog's head and down to the dog's haunches. He looks like he's part Newfoundland, a Newfie. The captain knew that Newfies are great water dogs. Their double coat keeps them warm and their web paws help them swim. An idea formed in the captain's head. We could use a good ship dog. This dog could be the one. Everyone liked the idea. They decided to name their new friend Sport. And that's how a homeless puppy found a home on a ship. So he's on board and Captain Maynard has even said once he was on board, he never had an inkling or reason to leave. And we'll find out in a minute what some of the reasons why. I'll share a few photos or illustrations here. And this is a section uh, the whole drawing of the hyacinth. And we've labeled it with some of the parts. There's the pilot house at the top. This is the well deck. All the supplies that were, were brought onto the ship were put on here. We'll find out about those in a few minutes. And the hyacinth was on Lake Michigan. Its territory was all of Lake Michigan. It was based in Milwaukee, but it would often come over to West Michigan to our area. And then it would go all the way up to the Straits of Mackinac. Big area, Lake Michigan's a big area, but it would uh, go off from spring until December, taking supplies to all the lighthouses on Lake Michigan. And there were a lot at that time, more than we have today. They also kept the buoys going. We'll show a picture of a buoy here in a minute. Now, Renee did a wonderful bird's eye view of the ship. And they're getting ready to take some supplies. And when I do show you the slides, I'll talk about this page, but this is an example of a lighthouse that's on an island. I'll come back to that. And I mentioned buoys. Here's a buoy. And we'll come back to this illustration in the slideshow, but I'd like to point out in the background, there is a lighthouse and that is big Sabo Lighthouse in Ludington, Michigan. And that lighthouse is open for visitors. Wonderful place to visit. I don't want to spoil anything. But let's jump ahead to the end of the story. Lots, Sport has lots of adventures. And one of his adventures was that he was lost in Chicago. And then he had to be reunited with his crew, giving a little bit away here, but that's the most exciting thing about sport. But I need to tell you that because that explains this illustration near the end of the story. When sport was on a passenger ship, the Indiana, and he was down, I imagined in the fast freight area, this was a large ship where families were taking vacations. And I imagined that the children were upstairs in the dining room and they heard that their ship had rescued a dog and they were, that ship was bringing the dog back to the ship it belonged on, the Hyacinth. And the children started asking their parents if they could come down and they did, they were able to come down. And the text of the book reads, they all wanted to hear the stories of the ship dog who fell into the Milwaukee River during a storm, who joined a crew and lived on a ship, who helped bring supplies to the lighthouses, who played baseball, who looked out for his crewmates on the Hyacinth, and who had made friends all around the lake. So here are those children that came down and Sport gets to be around some children. Here's Sport back at his ship. Again, kind of giving the ending away, but, but I won't read all the text. 
that night, Sport fell asleep to the sway of the ship and the sound of the water. He was a ship dog, and this ship was his home. We have a, an historical note, and I'll talk about that in the slideshow too, about sports connection to Ludington, Michigan. Again, I'd like to recognize Renee, the illustrator. She has some fantastic illustrations, and you have a wonderful story. Thank you for sharing a piece of it. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks. I know I, I take longer to read the whole story, but I, I did want to share some of the slides tonight since we have a family story, family story time and, and families and everyone can think about how do you find information? So I'll share that the slides now. Yes, let's delve into the history. You already gave us a hint about what yeah. the story is. <laughs> yes. So let's see how you found it. Yeah, so and just... if any of you come up with questions while um, she brings up these slides about the history, feel free to post them in the chat. We'll get to them later in the program. Okay. All right, I'll let you take it away with the slides. <laughs> okay. Oh. Catherine, oh God, we're having Catherine, just a just, second. Yeah, I'm disabled again from your end, yes. There we go. Great, yeah. That just you should be able to do that now. Okay. Okay. Okay, what I found early in, is everyone fine on seeing this then? Yeah. What I found early on was that Captain Maynard wrote a one-page article that appeared in the Lighthouse Service Bulletin. And if he had not written that one page article, this was a bulletin that was published in Washington, DC, and was connected with the United States Lighthouse Service, I would not have been able to write this book. So this shows the value of people journaling, writing things down, writing family history down, because once it's gone, it's gone, as we know. This is one of Captain Maynard's statements. Sport was just a dog, but he was always a good dog and a good shipmate, a friend to everyone, and everyone's friend. And that for sure was a reason not to have sport forgotten. Just to get us thinking about the lakes, this is not even, doesn't even look like November, it looks almost like a summer storm, but kind of a way to think, what have we seen when we go to the Great Lakes? Here's a, Renee again, I'd like to, Acknowledge Renee on the left, and there we are at a bookstore. Renee lived in Wisconsin, and now she lives in California, and she and I uh, co communicate quite a bit. She, and also the Wisconsin Historical Society Press that took a chance on sports story. Hey, here's that first page that I showed you without the text. And what that was based on was Renee using maps and photographs that I found, and I I know she found additional ones, but it was fun to work together and think about what was historically accurate. So if you look carefully here, here's an example of a map and that map gave us a sense of the Milwaukee River coming in to Lake Michigan on the right and the buildings. So this was a, a, a illustration from the, that year. I forgot what year that is. I've always wondered how they did those when they were often done before airplanes. I never researched that one, but it is historically accurate to see all the ships and action at, in the Milwaukee area. Another fun thing about the story was that it takes place between 1914 and 1926. So for anyone thinking about doing a book, you will find that you really get immersed in that era. And I love the concept that horse-drawn Carriages were still being used and automobiles were coming in. Technology was just coming in. World War, World War I had occurred and that brought technology. When the Hyacinth first started out, there was no radio on that ship. By the time it reached the 19 teens and the 20s, radio was uh, uh, installed on the ship. Big difference. And that of course is all connected with lighthouses and how they no longer became electrified. So there's a fun photo. 
think, think of your era, and I loved it. Here's the photograph, one photograph of many that helped Renee with the illustrations. And this is, uh, we're at the depot in Milwaukee, where it was based. The Hyacinth was built in Port Huron and by the Jinx Shipbuilding Company. And I've been to Port Huron and investigated the Jinx Shipbuilding. Again, a reminder that Michigan is a great maritime state, you know, rich history that makes us who we are. For fun, I found out that the high, I thought, why is the ship called the Hyacinth? Well, a little bit of research, I found out that most of the US lighthouse tenders were given botanical names. And I probably spent too much time thinking and looking at these ships, the iris, the geranium, the dandelion, the goldenrod. I just loved, just beautiful because these were working ships, but the decision was made to give them a, a botanical name. The bottom I even wrote down the, about the flower pot fleet. That, those were these boats that were used during the Civil War and they called them the flower pot fleet. And there's the hyacinth. I hope everybody thinks that's a fun aspect of the research I did. Knowing that not everything is digitized or available at a library or in her loan, I found out I needed to go to the National Archives in Washington. And this is one of the many log books that I looked through. This is just a few months in 1921. And this log book would have been on board the ship. And each day there was a, is a page that shows what what supplies they took on, what they were doing. If they were painting, they were always busy. If they were bringing on coal or um, bricks, um, buoys, they would have brought the buoys on board. Everything was marked. And uh, then, of course, the weather. It was always pretty uh, standard information, nothing very personal. That's what I was pouring through, trying to find anything of value about sport. And the value that I found in these books, other than finding out what, a high, what a, the Hyacinth did during these years, was in 1926, where there was an entry when sport had passed away of old age in 1926. So I guess I went through from 1916, 1914, all through those years, no mention of sport until 1926. So again, that was important in a minute, I'll share, share sports end of life. So those, um, again, those are at the National Archives, but no one has had the time to get those digitized. And then I could see handwriting, which is so nice. This is an example inside that log book of the crew on the ship. The, the ship had about 25 crewmen. The master is also called the captain. And this was just a rec record of when they went on leave. When they went off ship and took little vacations or a little break. Photographs like this helped Renee to draw the uniforms. What, what were the workers on the ship wearing? This is 1910. And here's how Rene used that photo and many others of crew to get a realistic look at what the crew was wearing. And of course, with the captain in the back, we definitely had to be accurate on that. It just couldn't be any old uniform. It had to match what the lighthouse service had required that captain to wear, and the men are just wearing their work clothes. Now, the dog part of it. I had never been around a Newfoundland, and actually I took the photos of sport to dog experts and veterinarians, and they felt that he was probably part Newfie, as I read in the story, and he was also part retriever. So, to get a sense of what a Newfoundland was like, I went to, my husband and I went to dog shows, dog um, trials, and this was a dog trial in Michigan in the fall, this was in September, and I had to see what, how the dog moved, and then write script, or write the text that would match that. So here's evidence that a Newfoundland 
can be in a small boat on the right and it can make a big arch up and jump in the water. So that's important because then I could write a scene where sport is retrieving. If you look in the bottom right under the buoy, the crewman has dropped his tool bag. Again, I made the scene up, but I knew it was possible because there are those buoys that the hyacinth was keeping up, maintaining. And sport, the retriever in him, sees that canvas tool bag and jumps in for it. And that was possible because I'd seen a real Newfie in, in action. And Albert says, let's get you home. We're not leaving you behind. So there's a continuing theme through the story of how we support each other and are there for each other as a team. And sport was on their team. As I said, the ship was all over Lake Michigan. So there's the map from the lake. And of course, we could not put every lighthouse there or every port, but it just scattered around the lake. And that research also involved lots of visits to lighthouses. I just um, became involved with thinking about that sport and the hyacinth had been to all those lighthouses. This is an example. White Shoal is just west of Mackinac, the bridge, and you can take a Shepler's tour, which we did, and See this lighthouse, one of the, actually I believe it was the largest on Lake Michigan at the time. And it's out on a reef, so the hyacinth would have brought building supplies out as this, this um, light was built in 1910. And it had a second order Fresnel lens. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. And that lens weighed, and it still does, it still exists. 3,500 pounds. It, it's no longer at the top, and that's also often the story of lighthouses. Lighthouse, um, lighthouses, when they were decommissioned, lights were taken down, they disappeared. Some of them are now in museums, which is really great. And this one rotated, and that's another aspect. Every lighthouse had a certain characteristic, a specific one. So anyone out on a ship would have that have the book in on board and they would see or they would know for, as they were out there a lot they would see a certain flash a certain a time lapse and they would know exactly where they were so there's the white shoal and just last month i finally got to see the fresnel lens which is at the great lake shipwreck museum up in paradise if you look in the back you can see the people in the background i Forgot to get the measurements on it, but 3,800 pounds, it is gigantic. And so inside of that, that Fresnel lens, those prisms would have been the small little light, and then it would have been reflected out. In this case, 18 miles. Okay, another example is a Grand Traverse, Traverse light. This is one where my husband and I, John, have been keepers two times, and I like to show this because there's the, on the left, there's the fuel storage. And the hyacinth would have come down. They would have, they landed off to the, on the right picture there. They would have, there were piers built out at that time. And they would have brought coal and all the fuel. And then it would have been brought up and put in the fuel storage building. And then on the right is the foghorn building. And of course that needed, needed a lot of fuel. So beautiful pictures at Grand Traverse. Nicely restored light. And if you have an interest in being a keeper, you can go there and live on the left side. <laughs> Upstairs, second floor, and great experience to actually be part of a lighthouse. Captain Maynard said, no boat could go ashore without sport. What did he mean? There he is, two crewmen. This have, would actually be a great time for an audience question that came I'm in. I'm ready. I am all ready. So this one's from Arlie, um, and you also have a hello from Arlie, Nico, Linus, and Florence. Oh, great. So they're all in the audience. Oh, I love those kids. They are interested in a lot of things. I'm glad they tuned in tonight. Okay, Arlie. So Arlie wants to know, is sport based on a real dog? Yes. Now, one thing when I talk, and I failed to say it this evening, Arlie, is the photographs that I'm showing are really sport from 100 years ago. 
And I skipped over that, but there he is, as that Newfie, there he is, Newfie Retriever Mix. He was a real dog. And Captain Maynard was the real captain who wrote about him. So um, it's interesting for us to think about dogs living 100 years ago, but the same as today. We take care of them don't we? And, and I believe you have a dog. So I bet you take care of your dog. And maybe I forget, a lot of people have rescued their dogs. So I all hope that uh, readers of the book see that connection with them, that maybe they've rescued a dog or they've helped a dog. Thanks for that question. I'll, I'll wait for another one. Yeah, we, we don't yep. have any questions oh, right great. this second. Oh, I'm glad. I'm, glad. I'm glad you broke in and I'll keep moving and I guess I'm good on time here. Well, we'll definitely have time for more questions. Yes, we'll have time for lots of questions toward the end of the program. So feel free to put those in the chat or save would your anyone, questions. Yeah, would anyone you. like to ask a question about this photograph? If you look in the background, would anyone like to ask a question about this photograph from 100 years ago? And it's it's not color, is it? So we, we're looking at a... Oh, graph. here's another uh, question. This one's from Nico. Um, he wants to know how old was Sport? Um, I think both in this photograph and then when he passed. Okay, good, very good question. Well, of course, as you saw, Sport was a puppy when they rescued him in 1914. This is almost a math question or math problem. He passed away in 1926. So he was 12, we know he was probably at least 12 years old and that's an old age for a dog. So when he passed away, he passed away of old age. And that's a question I'm glad you asked because sometimes I, I'm not sure it's because um, students think that, our children think that oh, he was out on a boat and it was dangerous out there. And it was big waves and they were, lots of things were going on in the ship. Boxes were being moved and cranes were being moved and things were rough out there. Then perhaps sport might've been hurt, but he, he was in great shape. And I think that's because 25 crew people were helping him out. <laughs> Good question. And I do not know the, photo, the year of this photograph. Nico, thanks for that question. And Ask people in your family if they have photographs that they need, if they've printed them out anymore, <laughs> but if they have them stashed in a drawer, they need to write down. Now, I know this is sport, but I do not know the year this was taken. So that's a fun project for a family is to remember the year and who's in the picture. And I do not know who these two crew people are. There's mm -hmm. one more current question that since you have this picture, it might you might be able to answer. Um, Linus would like to know what color the hyacinth was. Thank you, very good question because we do not have colored pho uh, photographs. What, what they were standard, and you can see on the background here is the white. That, that white area, the pilot house area is called the super structure. That's anything that's above the deck. So that is white. And then if you look carefully, you can see the deck, it's a wooden deck. And that was probably stained. I'm not sure what color that is. Let's see, I, I showed the picture of the hyacinth already. I can go back because then all the lower part was black. So that was another, that was uh, like lighthouses. They, they're called day marks. If you see a lighthouse that has black and white stripes, that's called a day mark. Well, the hyacinth really had a, or all the tenders had day marks. If the, a ship, again, often before radio would see the, Hyacinth out, they'd see, oh, they'd see that white superstructure and they'd see the black. Good question. Thanks, Linus. Very good eyes. Yes. Should I move on then? And okay, and Captain Maynard said no boat could go ashore without sport. Hmm, what did that mean? Well, I had to go see some more dog shows. And I knew this was, I would see it when I went. And this was in a, a September morning, nine o'clock in the morning. It was a little cool. If you look carefully, you can see a Newfie pulling in a small boat with one person. Now the Newfie has been, that's part of the competition. The person in the boat called and said, I need help. And the Newfie ran from shore, ran out and pulled the boat in. 
again, it's floating, it's a little light, but it shows the strength of Newfies and that they love to be in the water. They're water dogs. Captain Maynard knew that. They love to be in the water. So I then was able to have this scene in where it's the word is, the wording is, sport carried the line to shore, then it could be used to pull the boat in. Now, if you look way in the background, the hyacinth is way in the background because this was a shallow area and they sent a smaller boat in and sport's not going to let that small boat go in without him. So he jumped in the boat and then when they got closer to shore, they pull, threw the line out for the small boat and sport jumped in. We know he can jump in the water from small boats and then he pulled all, there's supplies in there and their crew, but there's just something about the wave action was coming in and we know they have this strength. I'm sure the crew would have paddled a bit too if they thought that sport was stressing a little bit. Then he's jumped off and there he is and he's at the Cana Island Lighthouse in Door County, Wisconsin. Hmm. Do you think those kids were happy to see a dog? that brought their supplies, that brought books and food. Perhaps their mom was out of sugar and they needed some sugar for cookies. I just imagine it and I bet, any, I hope all readers will think of that too. What would it be like to be a child and live on an island and your mom and dad were the lighthouse keepers and they had to keep the light going every night. So there's the lighthouse family and I mentioned baseball, didn't I, when I read a little bit of the ending. I just did, couldn't make up the sport was on a baseball team. I needed evidence, and here it is. A photograph of some of the crew from the Hyacinth, H on their uniforms for Hyacinth, and there is sport. I love the concept that they were able to work hard all day and then they'd come to a port and they'd play a team from another ship. They had to have some fun. It wasn't just all work, just like in our families, you need to have some fun after you've, after you've worked hard. So their sport, you can see them there. And here's the illustration that Renee drew. So sport, I imagined he was always out on the field. But one night they went to a new town or new crew. No one knew sport, at least someone on the other team. And that person, that baseball person said, no, we're not having a dog on the field. So the crowd started yelling, sport, sport, sport. We want sport. So there's sport. Again, that shows that he was part of the crew. Any more questions or I'll go again here. Everybody likes food in a story, right? Well, I had to get some food in the story. And I researched and I found all the things that the crew could have. Mutton, canned mutton, ooh, lamb, evaporated apples and dried peaches, along with things like vinegar and flour and sugar. Well, then I read a little bit further and what I found out was that the cook could ask the captain when they came to different place sports, could the cook go ashore and buy fresh food? Who wants dried apples in September? No, we want fresh. So that's why I wrote this line. And it's a, me it's a message or reminder to us in Wisconsin and Michigan that we have lots of fruit. And we know that people come from other areas and say, you have fruit in cold Wisconsin and cold Michigan? And this is the line, the crew hustled to the mess where they found biscuits, stew, and fruit pies. A simple sentence, but to me, it recognizes the, the history of fr the fruit industry in the upper Great Lakes. And there's sport, again, don't know the year, but there's sport with uh, one of the cooks. The most exciting thing I could find about sport was that he got lost in Chicago. 
makes sense. So the ship would come to all the different ports on Lake Michigan. He'd get off, make friends. Well, he did not hear the captain's whistle and the ship had to leave. They had to keep going. They had to keep making deliveries. They felt sad. Captain, oh, we only know this because Captain Maynard wrote it down. Well, a day or two later, there was an ice wagon. And this is a photograph that I, want, I love to share. The Pure Ice and Coal Company. This is an example of an ice wagon. So after I get off tonight, I won't spend time talking about it. But if with your family or with whoever you're with tonight, can you start thinking, a company that was, was delivering ice and coal? Hmm, what's that all about? So there's an the ice wagon. Anyway, there was a man who recognized Sport because Sport had been tied up probably to be a, a guard dog or a warehouse dog. And that the man driving this recognized Sport and thought, no, he needs to get back to his ship. So he took him back down to the dock in Chicago. And there it is depicted in the story. Sports ship is gone, but what was there was the SS Indiana, a passenger ship. So I had to research passenger ships, ships and it was the start of, of families taking vacations. And it's a pretty big one, isn't it? I forget how many people could be aboard, but there was sleeping on board and dining. And here it is. Looks like a, almost a cruise ship of today, but there it is in the 19 teens. The SS Indiana. So Sport was on that ship. For fun, I like I look up maps, and this shows an example of Chicago in the lower left and the routes of those passenger ships. Just this this company, and as you can see to the right, it would come up and go to all a number of vacation spots in Michigan, and then on the left, it did more of a hopscotch. It would go up and go to a different town, and then it would get all the way to the top to Mackinac. So sports on the ship, but he only has to go as far north as Milwaukee on the Wisconsin side. So he's on the ship, and as I said, the kids all came down, and there they are, hugging sport. We're not sure when this happened, uh, but I, I have the date here of 1919, just to identify the photo of the city of St. Joe, St. Joe in Michigan. Ships were named for towns and there's a girl with her sailor suit and that those were popular outfits for kids in the 19s and the 1920s and there they are asking what's this about sport and that's when I read they all wanted to hear about this dog and there he is back on his ship that night sleeping with one of the crew members and Renee and I, we talked, we said, yeah, he wouldn't be on the metal or wooden deck. Someone would have put a little blanket down for him. Um, last few slides, Ludington Sport passed away in 1926, just this last summer, a year ago. The Coast Guard, who was the continuation of the lighthouse service, um, when we notified them, they said, we need to, to lay a wreath on the water in memory of sport. So there are two Coast Guard employees, I'm not sure of their rank, and there's uh, the breakwater light at, at Ludington. So it was pretty moving to think sport had been there and the city was remembering him almost 100 years later. And the fun part is that I've seen so many children and families. We were doing some water sounding experiments and there's someone hugging big sport. I'd like to point this out. The family in the lower right, they were visiting Michigan from France. And that's a reminder to us that wherever we live in the United States, people are interested in this and we, we need to project and show our culture and history. So we had fun chatting with them. And there are my photo credits. And the last quote from Miss Captain Maynard, I'm certain that he had more friends, or should I say acquaintances, around the shores of Lake Michigan than any man on ship today. 
And again, thanks to Captain Maynard for those words. Are there any questions about sports story? I can go back to any slides or talk about anything. Um, we have a couple of questions coming in. Okay. Um, one of them uh, is a question from Jane. It's uh, asking about the large sport that I think you just had in one of the pictures. Oh, but she right. says, well, where did you get the large sport that's sitting on the rocker behind you? It's a perfect match. Oh, I know it is. It is a perfect match. Actually, I have small sm sports too. I didn't bring one today, but uh, the grandchildren have little ones. Once the, uh, the book was made, the publisher asked me for any ideas and I was having fun thinking, thinking of uh, Kohl's, plug for Kohl's here, <laughs> department store, where you, you'll go in and you'll see a book and a dog or any, there are often a lot of um, commercial books that are out there. You see a matching. And I, for fun, I just said, oh, how about a little sport? So they um, used Renee's drawings and had a small sport made. So I do have those small sports. They're about eight or 10 inches. Then they surprised me and they said, how about a big sport? for you to travel around with. And I said, oh yes. So this is big sport. He goes lots of places. He's been to Minnesota, he's been to Wisconsin. He's been across on the Badger, the ferry that goes across from Michigan to Wisconsin. He's been everywhere. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. <laughs> and then I think we had another question. Did somebody raise their hand? I saw it go away. But if you'd like to talk, um, just raise your hand and I can have you uh, talk to our guest author this evening. And I, I've got something to share. I can share something too also, I thought. Catherine. Well, we, we have a, another question here. I, yeah, definitely um, need to pause. I just get talking and get so excited about sport. Right. Um, this question is, what do you want readers to learn from sports story? Okay, right. It's, it's easy to think that a historical story just tells what happened. But as I worked through it and wished I had had sport, new sport or new, I, that I could talk to Captain Maynard, I realized it was all about taking someone different, taking someone in that you don't know about. And that's what they did, they took a chance. And that's what we do in life, we take a chance on something. We don't know how it'll turn out. And sports story shows that. And then you take a chance and then you work together. Maybe they got mad at sport once in a while <laughs> when, he, when he forgot to get on the boat in Chicago, but it all worked out. And how we work together and we're all different and that's to me is the story of history, the backstory, how people interact and um, make something happen. Thanks. All right. More questions? You can raise your hand um, or put them in the Q&A box or type them in the chat. Uh -huh. I don't think we have um, any current questions about the slide, so maybe we can come back to it if somebody comes up with a question. Oh, um, do you want to stop the screen share so we can see that a little bit better? Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. Will do. Because you can see it, but you want to be able to see it better. Okay. There we are. This is connected with anyone watching tonight, whatever your age. This is a light that's been around probably for my grandmother. I do not know the story of it, but as a, one time I looked in the cupboard and there it was as I was working on sport. I have no knowledge that our family was involved with maritime history. I don't know the story of it. So this to me is a reminder for, for, it, for us to talk about things in our house. And perhaps you can find something at your house or you can talk about a person or a story in your family and write it down. You know, I love to know where this came from. I don't know. I don't know that. So that's what I my also my wish for children is is that they look around and ask the elders in their families what was it like when they were growing up? Um, what did they do when they were growing up? Ask anyone about events that happened in their lives. 
because it, it's forgotten if it's not heard and if it's not written down. So this is my example. And as we know, photographs are often that, the case. But look around your house for some object that's just been there and no one's paid attention to it. No one's talked about it. Perhaps you can make up a story about what you find at your house, but perhaps somebody will have just a little bit of a story to tell you about it. And then maybe you better <laughs> write that story on it and make sure it stays with the object. So we have another question. Um, what, what made you want to write about sport? I mean, obviously you kind of discovered him and you realized this was kind of cool, but what made you want to sit down and actually write about it? Because you had to do a lot of research, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And this, um, forgive me if I mess up your name, but this question's from Achicho. Okay, yes. Thank you, Achicho, for the, for, the, for the question. Well, I think it shows that it could be you or it just happened to be me with sport, but you could find so any one thing you find, and I found sport, you get interested in it and you'd like to tell that story. I did not want sports story to be forgotten. And I actually, as I wrote it, I wanted children and adults, as now I've found out, to, to know about sport and his, and his crew. I felt it was too important. We cannot forget what happened 100 years ago and because there's still a message or there's still something very important that happened 100 years ago. So perhaps you'll find a story or again, back to ask, ask people in, that you're, you are around, whoever you see or live with, see if there's something they could tell you and maybe you could write a story about it. Thanks. That's great advice. There's so many stories that are important, um, you know, just like sports story, they go untold because somebody doesn't take the time to collect and write it down. Mm -hmm. Really wise words. So another question, not so much about sport, but um, about you. What made you and your husband decide to become lighthouse keepers? Oh, that's, that's fun. I, <laughs> uh, I think I just heard of, I think we went to a lighthouse. I cannot remember which one it was. And the volunteers that were there said, oh yeah, investigate. You can be a volunteer keeper at, at many of the lighthouses, not all of them. Now, of course, this summer things were restricted. So um, many of the lights couldn't. And I, I need to talk about that in a minute too. So lighthouses um, look for volunteers and you usually stay one week and you bring your own food, but you live, you often live in the quarters, the actual lighthouse, if, if it's still there. Sometimes there's just the tower, the actual lighthouse and there, you might have to live off site. But the fun part is that you just talk to people. And I need to say this too, that's, we learned from people that came in and it was evidence to me as people talked about their grandfather worked on a ship or the grandfather was on a, certain ship or they had stories and then we talk about I'd say well if I can do it you can do it and does that answer the question about I think it does and it really inspires all of us to you know try something new like that oh about the volunteering right yes yeah. so oh I will tell you about the 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 most rustic was up to Point Crisp 18 miles in on a two track pulling our little camper I think we made it we made it and once you're out there, there's no, they say, don't even use GPS. There's no cell service. Um, we did not have, we had a little bit of electricity in the, the gift area, the visitor center, a little museum. And I, oh, then we had, we used a solar panel on our camper, but it was beautiful. It's right there on the Southern shore of Lake Superior. And you're 18 miles from anywhere. <laughs> so, um, you have, you have to be brave at some of the site. I'm just joking. That's the most remote, but you have to be brave. But you, I would recommend to anyone investigate. Sometimes um, they might even still start in the fall. Not sure when the different ones take requests and you apply. And if you have some an interest, and again, you do not need to be a lighthouse expert. <laughs> and it's lots of fun. It sounds fun. Um, even at the most rustic ones. Um, it does sound like a little bit of work to get there, but how beautiful. So speaking of the history, because you know you obviously love Michigan history, 
How mm -hmm. can this ser book serve as a guide to history about the Great Lakes? Yes, thanks. Um, actually, last week I read, a, I was talking to another group and I, I uh, shared a passage from the Menominee Indians and they had, it had been translated in 19th century. I'll get to, <laughs> get to that. And the concept was, it was the actual words, I'm not sure the date, but it's actual words of Menominee. And they, it probably was a story that had been told because they were coming across from Menominee, Wisconsin over to Mackinac. And the wording was that they had ways of honoring the water. And that was, that to me is, goes right up to today where we honor the water. Even today we wear life jackets, the life, the Coast Guard is out there. So what I'd like us, uh, everyone to think about is the continuum of history. And there's another aspect that I, is I, I dwelled a little bit. I, someone could write a book about this. We always hear about our ancestors perhaps came across on the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean. They came across in those oceans. Well, immigrants and settlers to the upper Great Lakes came up, sure came on trains, but before that they came on ships and they were coming through the Great Lakes. So the lighthouses were built to protect those ships. So our ancestors could have been on a ship that was coming through Lake Michigan, down through Chicago, then settlers were going west or staying in Chicago, staying in Michigan, staying in Wisconsin. That to me is key, that there's a, what came before us? And there's so much we can think about that what came before us our ancestors came before us, just like sport came before us. So I hope students see that it's, uh, we, it's easy to think about today and tomorrow. What am I going to do tomorrow? But what happened 100 years ago? And sometimes something that happens 100 years ago uh, becomes important today. Something yeah. we do today will become a, a important 100 years from now. Yeah. And so, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't see any final questions. If you have a final question, um, feel free to go ahead and put it in the chat or raise your hand or put it in the Q&A box. But why don't you tell us um, where they could get a copy of the book? We have some that you can take home for just a little bit here at the library, but this is such a great st story. You might want to take it home to keep. So where could they get a book if they want to do that? Well, thanks, Catherine. It was fun to see the book at the Portage District Library. Um, you, can, you can order, I can throw up a slide here too, but Sports Ship Dog of the Great Lakes is available at any location where you get books. And we know in, in this world, it, it could be your local bookstore that uh, needs, needs your um, purchasing and they take phone orders and the local bookstore stores are working hard. They've worked hard through um, the last six months to keep going. So that's another thing. I've met so many nice bookstore people. I love them. Or if you need to, you know, if you need to order it online, it's available online from you know, Amazon or that, any location like that. So it's available um, wherever you get your books. And then just for fun, if you're in the Portage area, it became apparent to me today that if you would like a book signed, um, just let me know and I'll, I'll put my email up here too. And I can definitely sign a book and uh, get it to you in, in the area. And I, I, I love to sign books and think about and talk about who that who might be reading sports story. Is that close enough then? And Oh, that's plenty. I think everyone knows their favorite local bookstore and it's such a generous offer from you to uh, sign books for local um, individuals. Uh -huh. um, so if you have um, a copy of Sport Ship Dog of the Great Lakes and you want the author to sign, feel mm -hmm. free to um, contact the library and we can put you in touch with the author. Mm -hmm. um, or you can contact her through our, her website. So if you Google Sport Ship Dog of the Great Lakes, the um, great website for the book comes up and you can not only contact her, but you can learn more about the book as well. So I think that's all the time we have for tonight. Um, it was a pleasure to have you join us. It's always an honor to have a, a local author, but particularly one who is a Michigan notable author. So thank you for joining us and telling us more about your story.
Well, thanks so much. I appreciate everyone that came in tonight. I know everyone's busy with school and activities, but thank you. It means a lot to me that there are many people out in our world interested in history. Thanks so much. Thank you everyone for joining us. You have a wonderful evening. Bye now. Bye. Thanks.